Uh, the paper review, Emma Burnell, Candice Hallsworth, uh, we welcome them back. Very good to see you both. And uh, we're going to start, Candice, with you. The Bank of Mum and Dad, it features in the Daily Mail. Tell us more. Yes, so this story just struck me because so many people I know are trying to get on the housing ladder and are struggling. And the Bank of England did a study and they found that those who get help with their deposit for their house now can afford to buy a house much earlier at age 26 versus those who can't. The average is about age 37 if they're saving up themselves. And those who can get help from their parents can afford bigger houses, more expensive houses. They can then make more money when they sell them. So it's sort of cementing this inequality very early on. And people just aren't able to meet, meet that milestone that they used to because house prices are so expensive. Mm. This feels like the most obvious headline, does it not? If your parents give you yeah. 50k, you've got a head start. start. Funny yeah. that, right? Yeah. Mm. Um, mm. But it's also, I mean, it's not just that you get that head start. It's that a mortgage, generally, even today, costs less than rent. So you are, every single month of, of oh. that life, after you've bought that house, paying out less than your peers who are renting. Yes. Yes. So that gap is widening and widening and widening and widening every single mm -hmm. every yeah. single month. And that just means that the inequality in our society and the, the ability for those renters' kids to then get help will be lessened. So it's just generation after generation after generation that gap is widening. Yeah. My life was in reverse, that me and my brothers were the bank for my mum and dad because we were able to buy their council house mm. for them, yeah. and uh, that was the sort of sort of in in reverse. But when I look back at that, Emma, and I thought this was the most amazing thing to be able to mm. have a property because you just assumed the house was going to be replaced, and it wasn't replaced. Of no. course, it wasn't no. in the social housing stock. Every That's day. it, absolutely. I mean, you could not be more right. Yes, for one generation, um, the selling off of the council housing was a real game changer, a real life changer. Yeah. For people like your parents would have made an enormous difference. But because of the way it was designed, it absolutely wrecked our ability to have any social housing stock. So, for first of all, we don't have social housing available for cheap rent for people who need it. And second of all, it was only that generation who ever really got to buy it in that way. Um, because it just took away all the stock, so there's not re a replenishing of stock that's cheap to buy. It's terrible. London, I mean, you can wait for years to get social yeah. housing. I remember seeing a Channel 4 documentary on it, and I found it shocking. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. people were told, don't even try to get council housing in London. Move outside of London. You're not going to get anything. Something like 5,000 on the list or something. Wow. Um, five million. I mean, it, it, the, the social housing lists are um, high, and, and, and they were high when I was working in housing ten years ago. We were talking about uh, at least we are finally talking about the housing yes, crisis we are. because we it are. has been so under discussed for so long. And we're not meeting the targets. We've no. got to meet our housing targets. Not even slightly. Targets. But some of the, the the housing that's being built is very very poor quality. It's just yeah. not good. Oh, and it will have to be upgraded in five years. Small and not good quality yeah. as yeah. well. Yes. And and developers squeezing everybody every last penny. Yeah, absolutely, out of it all. Yeah. and it's not being. Uh, yeah, we're, we're going to have to retrofit these brand new houses to make them up to code for things like environmental standards. So yeah. it's absolutely crazy, and it, it should be completely changed. Now, listen. It? There's something I want to talk about here because I'm not sure. It came to light to me today. I only heard this in the radio. I don't live in Scotland, so I don't know this story. If you live in Scotland, you'll know this story. So, Police Scotland. Uh, basically said that if you are a copper in Scotland, you can't have a beard. And uh, some of the force have rebelled against all of this, and now Police Scotland have postponed the, the idea, the enforcement of uh, police officers being clean-shaven. Um, but um, so what, what's this all about? So I was quite baffled by this. I was like, yes. why have they brought in this? Apparently, if you, there is a reasonable expectation of you having to wear a certain type of mask within the police force, um, they don't work as well with a beard. This is this is like what's a robber's driven mask. it. All. Yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> basically. Yeah. Uh, um, and there so, is... so, so, so why is a police officer what I need to wear a mask? Um, I'm guessing that you might have to go into, for example, if you're um, going into a home that 
there may be a body hazardous, um, there may uh. be hazards there. So there are going to be times when police officers will need to be masked, but this does feel like a sledgehammer to crack a nut. And there are, it, there was no consultation, so it was just kind of handed down. And then um, there's been quite a lot of pushback, both from the Scottish Police Federation. The police, police said there's no consultation. <laughs> it's like, you, you're nicked. There's no consultation but there, I mean, is there's there? a difference between the police consulting criminals and the police consulting police officers. <laughs> and, and we know there is a blending of the two occasionally, but not, not yes. throughout the force. So there's been quite a lot of pushback from the um, Scottish Police Federation and from, um, obviously, people who um, may be religiously uh, more likely to have a beard, like Muslims, um, Sikhs. So there is a lot of... So um, they want to keep their beards and they're saying... So they want to keep their beards. So the, the consulta there has now been a consultation period put in so, and that's been extended um, so that they can um, properly okay. listen to the views of the force. OK. OK. <laughs> Candice, in the sun, one in three of us uh, couldn't speak to a doctor or a nurse for more than one hour. This is in the sun. Yeah, this is in the sun. So it's the Care Quality Commission did a study and they said that up from 2020, there's about 30, people are 32% more likely to have to make, wait more than one hour. And I thought... Two things when I saw that. I thought, one, 2020 was surely an anomaly. Hardly anyone was going to A&E. I mean, it was absolutely empty. Anyone I know who went in during the lockdown said you were sore almost instantly. Wow. And then um, also one hour. I mean, where I live, that would be being seen quickly. Most people I know sit in A&E for hours and hours and hours waiting to be seen. So, I mean, one hour sounds brilliant, but I don't know if I'm very London-centric mm -hmm. with this huge population and fewer staff to deal with the population pressure. Maybe outside of London, it's more the norm that you wait maybe an hour. That's a lot. I think also, if we're talking averages, um, there will be times, the, the times that you expect A&E to be busy, Saturday nights, spring to mind. Mm. Um, then they will be much, much higher. So it may be the case that um, where they've done... We, we're thinking about averages and the times that we're most likely to see a and &E. I mean, I know you've got children, so they're, they're going to be in and out all the time. That's why I know so much about a and &E wait times. <laughs> um, but for, for, for most people who aren't taking kids in, it's going to be the busier times. But it, um, other times, you would be expected to go straight into triage. You wouldn't necessarily be expecting to get treated with Within an hour, but to be seen to have that first initial assessment, you're an immediate to, to case. You're not. You're, yeah. yeah. Now you talked about kids there, which brings to the story in the Times. Um, only half of people today plan to start a family. They have no plans for children at all. I think this is a very interesting debate yeah, it because part of the country is sitting saying, oh, we're being swamped with migrants coming into the country. And then you get the whole um, business side of government saying, we need people to be able to be here to work. Then you've got industry saying, we don't want you to work. We're going to stick a machines ticket in the ticket offices and, and do away with people. What a state of confusion. Is it a good idea or bad idea to have kids, Emma? Uh, well, I don't have children, and that's very much my choice. Um, I, I have a niece and nephew I adore, so I get to spend time with kids. Well, not kids anymore, they're 14 and 18, bless them. But um, it, I think the pressures, there are, there are dual pressures on young people um, that they're talking about in this story. And first of all, they're looking at this world and they're thinking, why? And, earth would I bring a child into this world? You know, they, this is the generation who are most concerned about environmental disaster, they're battered by the financial um, crisis, they're battered by the cost of living crisis, and they're just like, yeah, I can't afford it, it's not a world I want to bring a child into. Um, but they are also, 70% of them are saying they're still under quite a lot of pressure to have children, however much they individually don't want to. Saying 70% of them feel pressure from the, their family to have children to yeah. settle, settle down, as it were. Did you ever feel pressure? No, I mean, um, my parents were great about it. Um, I, I kept saying, for years and years and years, I kept saying, in a few years, in a few years, in a few years. I was married for a while, we kept saying, in a few years. And eventually I realised that I kept saying that because actually I didn't want to get to the in a few years. And, and you know, it's not a 100% choice. Mm. Uh, it's not one of those things where I definitely knew immediately I was never going to have children. I have friends who are very much like that. Um, it was, you know, on balance, this isn't the right thing for me. Mm. But you can understand, can't you? I mean, we had that story about buying a house. Yeah. If you cannot afford a yeah. home of your own, 
then you, couldn't, you certainly couldn't afford a child to go in it, could exactly. you? Exactly, and this is what demographers who study this say. They say with millennials, often they do want children, but they just don't feel they can have children because of housing costs, worry about the future. I mean, we are in a time of crisis, and I think when you look historically during any sort of crisis period in history, people do have fewer children. I mean, I look at my grandparents' generation, the silent generation, the generation born during the war. They were a very tiny generation. People just weren't having kids then. Mm -hmm. Candace, how old are your two sons? Four and two. Four and very two. cute. It wouldn't be in the market for, as uh, entertainment goes, do they buy comics or do you buy comics for them? Not yet. At some point, because my husband loves comics and graphic novels, he'll get them into it. See, I this think. is my theory that